sing another in the fire. And we sang this not too long ago by Chris Davenport and Joel Houston. Yeah, the words in this song are so good. And what's awesome is praise and worship music is always written like left to your interpretation. Like you basically have to figure out how they do it because there's not, it doesn't really tell you how it goes. And this song is like, it just tells you how it goes. It's great. There's, there's I, three pages telling you how to do it. And I really like the lyrics on this song.
joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be this together. Um, this is called Holy Spirit. It's pretty straightforward, so hopefully we can pull it off. Um, this is by Brian Torwalt and Katie Tornwalt. Um, and a lot of times people hear this sung when popularized by Francesca Battistelli. It's a good one. Nothing worth more that will ever come close 
first time. <laughs> I like that song. That's really nice. Good song. Yes. <laughs> All right. I just love that. I um, love those songs because we're really talking about the Holy Spirit and how he's working through people. And um, so that's exciting way to, to get into what we're doing tonight. I'm supposed to move this out of the way, Some my husband told me. So, um, so last week, we left off with Hosea, the really beautiful story of, of Hosea and his wife, his wayward wife, that he won back in the end, which is so much like uh, the Hebrew people and how they kept leaving God and how God plans to reunite with them and with us. And while there's judgment, there's always hope and always love. And the really key of last week's lesson is that because the Holy Spirit of God loves us, we can grieve him because he loves us. And so that's the interesting piece of what we're going over tonight. So um, while I was doing research this week, I'm going to go back to what else we were talking about. There was this also this other great prophet named Micah. And I know we mentioned him during this time when the northern kingdom is being totally trashed and torn away by the Assyrians and the southern kingdom has been pretty well protected because it's had some good kings for a while and it would have like good king, bad king, bad king, good king and, and so on and so forth but um, there was this prophet named Micah and I thought this was interesting we talked about he is the one who, who did say that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem so that's interesting so these little, they call them the minor prophets but it's not minor because they're not important. They say huge things. They're just smaller books. So I know that um, if you haven't had time, read Micah. It's a short book. I, I encourage you to also read Hosea. What a beautiful book that is. Um, Micah, while he was ministering to these kingdoms, he witnessed idolatry, evil business practice, dishonesty, cheating, bribery, and internal strife and corruption. Wow, does that sound familiar? Um... God was not allowing these um, sinful practices to continue. That is a quote I took from lifehopeandtruth.com, the prophets, the minor prophets. So um, interesting. I really love that quote. He witnessed idolatry, evil business practices, dishonesty, um, cheating, bribery, internal strife, and corruption. And so God was not going to allow that to continue. Interesting. So... Um, that's an interesting book that Micah, all, there's all these people warning the northern kingdom, warning Nineveh, warning the southern kingdom, warning the Moabites, warning the Edomites, warning the Ammonites, warning, 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 warning. But nobody paying attention, or very few. So we did have one guy that we talked about last week, or the week before last, who really was paying attention, and his name was Hezekiah. He was the king of Judah. His father had been involved in heavy idolatry and Baal worship, and his father had executed, or had not executed, but sacrificed some of his sons to the fire, which is a Baal practice. So, and remember, we compared that to our today's practice of, of abortion, which, um, you know, Colorado just defeated late-term abortion. So in Colorado, you can have a baby, you can go in all the way up to full of pregnancy and have an abortion. So our country is doing some of these same detestable practices, sadly. So, um, but during the time of Hezekiah, we had this amazing guy by the name of Isaiah. And Isaiah is considered by Chuck Mis Missler. I really like this guy. You can find him on Prime, the Bible in 24 hours. I really like him, he's really cool. Anyway, Chuck Missler says that Isaiah is the messianic prophet because he told so much about Jesus before he ever came. He, you know, remember we talked about how he could have written Handel's Messiah because it was so much of his work in Handel's Messiah. So very interesting. He's called the messianic prophet. He was around when Hezekiah was king, and he influenced Hezekiah. If you remember, he's the one that said, Hezekiah? Don't you give in to Sennacherib. Don't you listen to him. Don't you let him in your city. Don't you do it. Because God is going to deliver you. He will not come to your city. He will not even fire an arrow. 
And sure enough, that night, the whole, the whole group of soldiers, all the legions of soldiers, were struck by some kind of overnight plague. And they woke up to all those corpses. And of course, Hezekiah was delivered. And God surrounded him because he was faithful. He was faithful. He went around tearing down all the idols. He had like a revival. There was so much going on. He took down all the usher poles. He's the guy that built that cave down to the given springs. And it's marked with his name now. And, and that's how they were able to, in Jerusalem, survive sieges because they had water. And even if when they tried to reroute the water, they could still have water. Sometimes how these, some of these people would take a city is they would go in and surround them, starve them out, but also cut off their water supply. And they couldn't do that to Jerusalem because of Hezekiah. Pretty amazing guy. And the Lord really surrounded him and blessed him. And he became wealthy. And, and the Lord really just like put this big protection around him. And and rewarded him for his amazing faithfulness. You know, he, this guy was pretty amazing in his faithfulness. Even after having a father who was a, a child um, sacrificer guy. So it's pretty amazing. And I know that Isaiah had a powerful influence on him. You can bet that he did. So then in 2 Kings 20, so we're looking at different passages. 2 Kings 20, 1 through 11, and 2 Chronicles 32, 24 through 31, Hezekiah got very sick. And Isaiah told him to put his affairs in order, that he was going to die. But Hezekiah pleaded with the Lord. He wanted more time. He pleaded with the Lord, and he was like, Lord, I have been faithful all my life to you. Please give me more time. And so Isaiah, God told um, Isaiah to go back and tell him, okay, I'm going to grant you more time because you were faithful. I will give you 15 more years. And so God did listen to him. Here is cries. Here is pleas. And, um, and he became healed and he got better. Now, you should know that about this time, Hezekiah gets visited by envoys from Babylon. These are diplomats. And they had heard, they said, that Hezekiah had been sick. And they brought him gifts. And they said, Hey, Hezekiah, we heard you're sick. We brought you all these gifts. We're so glad you recovered, pal. And they came in, and Hezekiah was so pleased. And I was thinking about why they were pleased. And you got to know uh, that when I was doing some research, they had the same enemy. They both had the same enemy of Assyria. And Assyria had come down to Babylon. I actually didn't know this until I was looking into this recently came down to Babylon and wiped out the city. And um, so for a time, Assyria even was down on the Babylonians. They had taken all of the northern kingdom, and they knocked out a lot of the southern kingdom. They were taking everybody. So these guys had a common enemy. So he was very happy to see them. But what he didn't know is the Babylonians were on the rise. They rebuilt their city. And they were coming back. And actually, the Assyrians allowed them to rebuild their city. So, um, so these Babylonians had to be pretty cunning to pull that off to the Assyrians. So when they came to Hezekiah, you can guess they did not have the, his interest in mind. But Hezekiah was so happy. He was like, let me show you around the palace. And he takes him everywhere shows him the treasury and all the stuff. And God had blessed him because he had served him faithfully. Sort of like, come and check out my treasure room, you know? And so they're like, wow, Hezekiah, you're awesome. You're so awesome. Check this out. So when they left, Isaiah came in and he's like, so, had a meeting today with the Babylonian guys. And this guy's, yeah, isn't that great? They brought me gifts. They're happy that I'm well. And he's like, wow, everything they saw today, they will haul off from you. And so that is a stunning moment. And Hezekiah is, is a humble enough guy. 
Although he let his pride get to him with these guys. He let his pride get to him. He's like, come and see what I have. And he let his pride get him just for that moment, just for a moment. And Isaiah said, they're coming back. Basically, Isaiah's like, you've just thrown your pearls before the swine. Everything they saw, they're going to haul off. And they're going to haul off your kids and make them eunuchs in their palace. And Hezekiah was grieved. But he never rebuked the man of God. That's interesting about him. When he gets bad news, he's just like, may the Lord be it as he says. But he, but he was relieved because Isaiah told him it would never happen in his lifetime because he was faithful. But what he didn't know is he just let, he just let the dogs in the door, basically, to see everything, and they were going to come back and get it. And so that's kind of sad and scary. Um, but Hezekiah lived for a little bit longer, actually 15 years, and um, in the meantime, he's protected, he's taken care of, but, this, but the Babylonians are building and building and building. And they eventually take Assyria out. And so um, Isaiah is talking to people and he's warning them. He's, was, he's, um, he's warning the northern, or the southern kingdom saying, you know, there's still some practices happening here. And after Hezekiah died, especially, his um, son Manasseh took over. Now, I don't know why Manasseh was a bad guy, but he took over at 12. So maybe that's it. He just too, men, too much too soon went to his head. But Manasseh was not a good guy. And so Isaiah, after Isaiah fades out of the picture, but Isaiah sees what's coming, and he tells, he does this verse I love. This is my favorite verse from Isaiah. I just wanted to share it with you because it shows that he has hope. And he says, um, this is Isaiah 41.9, I have called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, you are my servant, for I have chosen you, and I will not throw you away. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. I love that verse. So, um, so what he's saying, I see what's happened. You're going to be dispersed, Israel. So this has a double meaning. Not only does it mean something for us, it meant something to them. He's saying, you're going to be dispersed. But I, Israel, I'm going to bring you back, Judah, and you're going to come back. And um, I have not rejected you. I'm, I'm allowing you to be punished for your sin, but I'm not rejecting you. And so Hezekiah passes on, passes on to his, to his son Manasseh at the age of 12. And Manasseh is so bad. He's like the worst. I mean, if you can compare him to Ahab, it would be close. He does everything evil. Builds, he desecrates the temple, puts up um, idols in the temple, puts a shiro, Asherah poles on, under every tree. He does every evil thing. There's temple prostitution. There's terrible stuff. Even child sacrifice, again, in one generation. Isn't that crazy? One generation, and that's in... That's referred to both in 2 Chronicles 33 and 2 Kings 21. So he defied God in every way you can imagine. He was so bad. The Bible said he's just as bad, if not worse, than anyone before him. So he's bad. So the Lord allows him to be taken captive. The Assyrians aren't quite dead yet. They're losing power, but they take him captive. And it says in the word that they put a hook in his nose. Remember how the prophets predicted that they'd haul you off with hooks in your nose? They put a hook in his nose and they hauled him back to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, and he was there for a really long time. And while he was there, he had a come to Jesus meeting, a come to God meeting. He didn't know Jesus exactly, but he had a come to God meeting, and he repented. I mean, like, really repented really repented and just came, and I'm sure that his father and Isaiah and the words of both of those men came back to him, and he repented of all his sins. And so the Lord is forgiving, and he restored him back to his throne. And so God is forgiving, but the damage had been done. 
The kingdom is already... So he starts tearing things down and starts re-having a new revival and he's encouraging the people, no, I was wrong, come back to God, take this down. But you know what? The people were already on that train going downhill. So um, he died and he, his 22-year-old son became king and his son was named Ammon. And Ammon was so evil. I'm sure Ammon was thinking... You know, I'll just do like my father. I'll do all my crazy, wild stuff. And then in the end, I'll come back to God and get right with God. I'll do that. But Ammon only lived a few months because he was assassinated. So he was only king for a few months, and he was assassinated. During this time, there was another um, prophet by the name of Habakkuk, Habakkuk however you want to say it, 2-4 says, look at the proud, they trust in themselves, their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by faith. Um, and some, in some version is, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. And it goes on to say, wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as, as, wide as the grave and like death, they are never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many nations and people. So interesting that even in this time when Manasseh goes crazy, there's prophet after prophet saying, hey, people, come back to God. Come back to God. God will restore you. And then this, this guy, Ammon, didn't have time. He didn't have time because he got assassinated. Now the kingdom was so into violence and everything at that point, that they went around and assassinated all the assassins. It's kind of like Julius Caesar all over again, right? I mean, this is before Julius Caesar. But it's very similar to that. They come in on him, and then everybody got mad and killed all the assassins. So there's all this strife and discord because the people had gone away from God. And even though Manasseh came back, the damage was done. The damage was done. But I want to focus a little bit on this... Um, a uh, word by Habakkuk, um, or Habakkuk, however you say it. How do you say it, Matt? Either way. Either way. Okay, I don't know. I've heard it both ways. Okay, so, anyway, the righteous will live by faith. It's an amazing passage in a small book that changed the world. And I'm going to tell you how. It's really interesting. So, there was this wonderful young priest, very intelligent priest, who was a devoted Catholic priest, and he, his name was Martin Luther. And he was a great student, but he was under this torment. Like, he never thought he was ever right with God. So he would pray for hours, and he would go to confession, and the priest got tired of talking to him. Martin Luther, shut up. I heard this yesterday. And then he would go to the steps, and get down on his knees and get in sackcloth and he'd whip himself with whips. And he's like, I've never attained my righteousness. I can't do it. But he was a very good student. And one of, the, one of his associate priests came to him and, and talked to him and he came to this verse, the righteous will live by faith. And he was transformed. He was like, ah, oh, I just need to trust in Jesus and live by faith. And so he was completely transformed by his faith in God. And that's why he began to see things in a whole new light. It's like, I'm saved by grace. It's not my works. It's not my, it's not my torture. It's not my hours of prayer on my knees, on my face. It is Jesus Christ who, is my, in, who intercedes for me. It's not on me, but I live by faith. That's my responsibility. And so he just went crazy. And he was a devoted Catholic. I just, he just let everybody know, hey, the righteous will live by faith. We're saved by grace. And he saw a lot of corruption. And like one of the things he saw was like um, when he went to Rome, he saw that there were priests like visiting prostitutes. Some of the same things that we're looking at here with these old prophets. They're seeing this corruption and they're like, hey, people, we're supposed to be the people of God. We don't live like this. And um, Martin Luther uh, really wasn't going after the Catholic Church. He was just going after the corruption. 
that was happening that was legit. He, he loved the overall. And he felt like if we just, if I tell, if I go to the people above me and I talk to them about this, they'll see what I'm saying and they'll want to reform. And they'll want to reform. And so, but what happened was, is some of the people above him were very corrupted themselves and they're like, shut up, you're just some little priest. We're going to excommunicate you. And they actually tried to murder him. And, um, but he went to, you guys know the story, he went to all these different meetings and said, um, and finally came to the place where like, you denounce all this work that you've done. You denounce everything you say. You denounce it. And he, he did at first. He got really scared because he knew he was going he to be on the, he's going to be burned at the stake. He's knowing what's happening here. Because the heresy thing was going crazy. The Spanish Inquisition, they were pulling people's tongues out and putting them on the rack and lighting them on fire. He's, and he got a little scared. I would have been a little scared. And then he came back out. He like prayed that night. He came back out and he said, if anything that I have written disagrees with the word of God, then I will recant. But as far as what I've said about being saved by grace, here I stand. I can do no other. That's where I am. And so he, he risked it all to say, here I stand. And he was wanting to come to a consensus with them, but they wouldn't have it. But ironically, after one of these meetings, he got kidnapped. And he thought, I'm going to die. And he got kidnapped by people trying to save him. So it was pretty awesome. They kept him hidden out, and he wrote the Bible in German for the German people. So he wrote the scriptures while he was hiding out, staying alive, hours alone, kind of like COVID. <coughs> so now you know how Martin Luther felt, right? He's locked away. No one can know where he's there. He's just up to a few people. And he's writing out the word of God in German. And so, isn't it amazing how this guy changed the world? And I think had the people over him heard what he said and listened to what his concerns about corruption, because there was actually a priest by the name of Tetzel who was selling indulgences. And this guy was going around saying, if you just buy, you can buy your way into heaven. Just put some money in this thing and uh, it's like when the copper sings a soul from purgatory springs or something like that something like that and he went around preaching and even the poor people were given everything they had to just be saved and martin luther said if you could be saved by money why wouldn't god just save everybody like that doesn't even make any sense martin luther was a very good student and he was also concerned about the religious rights of, oh, please come touch the bones of John the Baptist. And by the way, drop your money. So there was some, there was some legit corruption, and I'm not saying that all the Catholics were bad, because they certainly weren't, but he was up against some very um, serious corruption. And there were great things happening in other parts of the world, but he was really up against some bad stuff. And he said, he was quoted as saying, you know, if there are enough nails that went through the body of Christ to shoe all the horses in Saxony. In other words, it's not a real deal, people. You know, we're making money off things that we, just off these relics, relic worship. And so he really brought out the relic worship. And so it's really interesting that he, because of this one verse, the righteous will live by faith. And he was completely changed. And so, um, and that brought on the Reformation. So it's really interesting that he, what he was seeing, what, I think it was really similar to what some of these prophets were seeing. Like Habakkuk was asking God, why are you allowing these, this evil? Why are you allowing these people to get away with evil? And I, you know, I'm thinking that sometimes when I'm watching the news lately. God, where are you? Why are you allowing this? Why are you allowing abortion? Why are you allowing? Well, it's not God that's allowing. It's we that make the choice. 
But it's like Habakkuk going, why? Where is your wrath, God? Where is it? And then all the other prophets saying, well, it's coming. It's coming, but you have this chance. And every prophet is like, but you have the chance to be redeemed. You have the chance. God wants you. He wants you. He doesn't want to punish you. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants you. So I think it's really interesting. Billy Graham was quoted by Missler as saying this. If God just doesn't judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And what he's saying is that there's so many evil things happening right here in America. This is old. Billy Graham said that forever ago. I don't know how long ago. I wish I had a date. But that was before transgender and trans everything else and trans, you know, transcending the word of God and making it into whatever we want. That was before everybody knew about abortion. That was before we had the, the immorality that we have now, the unspeakable things and, um, that we see now, and the throwing the pearls of, of what God made us before the swine, like we have now. And all of these prophets saw that. So, so we have these leaders, we have these people that wanted to change the world, and, you know, at least Martin Luther got through to people, some people. Not all of them. Not some people that could, should have listened, but he got through to some people. And so when, from this passage, we can learn a few things that are really important. First of all, don't throw your pearls before the swine. Jesus said this. That's what Hezekiah did. When, he, he, when his pride got away with him, and he showed him all the treasures of the kingdom. And our society does that. I mean, we, the most sacred things, we degrade. We degrade the most sacred things in our country, and our children, and um, sexuality is something that we just throw before the swine. It's just terrible. And, and we trust in people that shouldn't be trusted. Like even our media, I'm just appalled by some of the things. I'm like, how can we trust these people? We are, I'm, you know, sometimes I'm thinking about all this that's happening on Twitter and Facebook, and I'm like, are we throwing our pearls before the swine here? I'm just wondering. I'm just thinking. I'm wondering. Because one thing we also know is that God will judge sin. He will judge it because he's holy. He will judge it, and he's holy, and that's part of who he is. But he always wants us, and he's grieved, and he's ready to restore and forgive. He's always ready to restore and forgive. Um, but we have to remember that sin has a consequence, and all has a consequence, and all what all of us have free will. We have a choice. You know, people are always like, "Why, if there is a God, why is there so much suffering?" And I know I've said this before. If there isn't a God, why do you care? You're using a moral argument. Um, for a non-moral statement. If there, the reason that you're, the suffering is a problem is because we know it's not right. There's a God who tells us that's not right. You know you shouldn't live that way. And so sin has a consequence, and our world is broken. And we look around and we think it's broken. But again, I'm reminded, God restores and forgives. And there's Christians all over the world that really love Jesus. And they're sitting in places like this going, yeah, we love Jesus. We're going to serve him no matter what. No matter what people do, no matter who's president, we're going to serve Jesus, no matter what. And so the other thing that we can see here is that the prophets um, still apply. Their words are so amazing. I am so amazed by these prophets, how they spoke to that generation, how they speak to us now, how everything they said came true. In fact, in those days, you know how they told you a good prophet, a prophet of God from a non-prophet of God? A good prophet of God was never wrong. Now, how many people do you know that are never wrong? A good prophet of God was never wrong. And so, um, so the things that we, and, the, and here's what's cool. 
So people, they're so accurate, like I said before, people are trying to say, they wrote this after the fact. These guys were just pretending they knew this ahead of time. Till they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1947, proved that these guys had spoken these things hundreds of years, hundreds of years before they happened. Like 700 years to 500 years before, that, before this happened. Um, and then, it's amazing. And they gave warning to Israel. They gave warning to Judah. They gave warning to everybody. Assyria, Babylonia, over and over. More than one prophet to each place. Several prophets to each place. Even Nineveh. Even the Assyrians. Terrible people. More than one prophet. Babylonians. More than one prophet. So, Jesus, because, so because of that, because of this universal going fishing that God does, hey, I'm here for you. I'm warning you, but mostly I'm warning you because I love you, and I want you to follow me. And he's doing it over and over again. Shows us that he has a universal plan of redemption, and it's not just for the Jews; it's for everybody. But we have to receive it. He wants us all, but we have to say yes. And last of all, the righteous will live by faith. That is amazing. Amazing words. And Isaiah 26 says this one important thing. I want to close with this because I know, I mean, we're in turbulent times again. You know, COVID numbers are going up. Everybody's like, kids are talking today. Even Kinsey was talking. Will we be going to school? Will we not be going to school? I don't know. I just get up and go to school. And then tomorrow they'll tell me not to go to school. Even kids are in turmoil right now. They're like, today we're going to school. Okay. You know? So it's just crazy, and we're all in, those of us who have, you know, ministries and business, we're like, are we open today, are we closed today, are we open tomorrow, are we not, are they going to shut us down, are we going to keep going, and just follow the grace of God, right, live by, the righteous will live by faith, no matter what, we'll just trust in Jesus, here's a great verse, Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, you will, you will keep deep, you will have deep peace. You will be kept in perfect peace. Sorry, did a typo. All who trust in you and whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for your Lord is the eternal rock. He humbles the proud and brings down the arrogant. He brings it to the dust. You will be keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. That's the King James Version. Whose mind is stayed on you. So that's... So we have to keep our eyes on Jesus, guys, and keep on living for God. And we don't know how much time we have. We don't know if we're going to live a long time like Hezekiah or, you know, a short life like Ammon. And, and we don't have time to play around with our lives like Manasseh did and then hope to come back to God. We really don't. And so God wants us. We should just submit and just... I know that we're having a hard time living by faith right now. When I watch the news, I'm like, I will live by faith. I will live by faith, right? Amen? Um, so let's pray. Is there any special prayer request tonight? Yes. Well, Rhonda Locker will be going into surgery at 8.30 tomorrow up in Jackson. Okay. She um, wanted us to pray for her. Okay, anybody else? Pray for my brother to live in faith. Okay. He's actually, yeah, he's, I don't know, he got, um, my Holly, he did, he got um, the news that he has prostate cancer. But last year it was kind of interesting because he had colon cancer, they thought, it didn't turn out that. And then when he told me about the news prostate, I'm like, that sounds much better though than colon. Mm -hmm. And I just told him, I said, you know, I really honestly believe that God's just going to pull you through. Yeah. You know it. What's his name? Wally. Wally. Wally? Wally? Okay. Dear Lord, we just pray for the people that just pray that all of us will just live by faith. This is a hard time. We're walking through struggles. Um, we feel like Martin Luther facing a world that's just indifference to you. And Lord, we just we pray right now that you just keep us trusting in you. We will live by faith. We will walk in your peace. We'll keep our eyes on you. We pray especially tonight for Rhonda and her surgery that she has tomorrow, Lord, that you would make the doctors do exactly what they need to do, that you would keep her safe and keep her in peace and her family to know that, um, that you are there. You're there in the room. I know they don't let people come to the hospital now, so let her know that you're there in the room with her at every moment. 
and lord we pray for a while these facing all these different trials and lord i just pray that you would just live by faith that you would use this to draw him very close to you but that you would heal him and deliver him and lord we just pray that you would just this is a test of his faith that he will come through with shining colors and help us all to just trust in you right now in this time of turmoil in jesus name amen Step out of here.